So an overview of what we're talking about. I'm going through the basic access control, authentication, authorization, and audit, uh, and then going through some more ephemeral stuff. So configuring services securely, uh, configuring your firewall, uh, basic intrusion detection, and then doing compliance. And so, of course, starting with authent authentication. Uh, Pam, one of the neatest things about Linux that you've likely never touched. Um, Generally, people don't interact with PAM enough or much at all because it's kind of abstracted away from you as a user. You don't really care. Um, but it is the way that you authenticate with you, the Linux kernel. It's super neat. Um, very, very different than Windows, where all of that is kind of walled off from you. Uh, PAM is 100% configurable from you as a user. Uh, this is really cool, um, but it also has some downsides, of course. Um, if someone mucks with your uh, PAM configuration and changes some things, um, you can do some pretty malicious things there. Uh, but almost, not almost every, but all, most services that want to authenticate you, whether it's your lock screen, um, your, your display manager, uh, SSH, sudo su, all of those back into PAM for authentication. And so it's going to be all over your system. So an example of PAM config, uh, as you can see here, uh, you have four different sections, auth, account, password, and session, uh, and they're called PAM stacks. And so for the auth stack, as you can see, uh, we have a handful of modules that are, roll, that are uh, loaded, five here, uh, and they have different verbs that describe how they function. And so when I enter the system auth um, PAM configuration, um, let's say I'm trying to auth as a user, then I slowly traverse down this stack. And so um, you, uh, you start with PAM env, uh, and you can see this has the required directive. That means if this module fails, then the entire stack fails. Similarly with fail delay, uh, and then you have the sufficient directive, which is very different. Uh, if you hit a sufficient directive and you pass, then um, it automatically kicks you out and you have logged in. You finally have requisite, which means that it'll fail, but fail immediately, not go through the entire stack. Uh, and then finally required, which once again, um, if you fail, you fail. And so you have um, the following directives like I previously showed. You have auth, which verifies the user identity. And so when you're trying to actually auth as your user, um, you're using the auth directive. The account directive, which allows you to, it checks to see if your account is allowed to do what you think you can do. Um, this is generally not on the level of like pseudo configuration, like checking your groups, although it can be. It's a lot of time checking the time of day against your user or checking your UID against um, a list of UIDs to see if you can do that task. Uh, la session, which controls steps that happen at the beginning and end of your authenticated session. Uh, and so this can be setting an authentication token, removing that token, uh, things like that. And lastly, password, uh, which goes around changing your passwords. So if you've used the passwd utility, um, it's using PAM in the back end to set settings for how you're allowed to change that. And then once again, the controls. Uh, required, if it fails, the entire stack is processed and it kicks you out. Uh, requisite, fails immediately. There's, there is different debate on what you should be using required versus requisite. And this is largely due to the fact that an attacker could reasonably gain information about your authentication stack if you're using requisite. Um, and so if you have a check that requires something like your UID to be a certain number, and that's a requisite, um, I can brute force that check because it'll kick me out sooner than other checks that are happening. Um, whether that's true or not, I'm not sure. Um, I have not experienced that, but that's the argument that I have seen. Uh, sufficient, uh, if it succeeds with no failures in the stack, then you succeed completely. Uh, this is a neat directive that causes a lot of issues if you're writing your PAM config by hand, uh, because you might be trying to set directives below the sufficient line, uh, expecting the user to have to continue authentication, uh, but sufficient kicks them out early. Uh, we had that bug over at the Honors College, actually, uh, when we were rolling out a new login solution. And, and then lastly, optional, which is not a very largely used um, option. But it, uh, if it's the only directive set, like it's the only module being used, uh, then optional matters. Otherwise, it does not. So useful modules if you're trying to secure a system. Uh, PAM fail delay, um, as seen here. Uh, it sets a delay for in milliseconds. Uh, it's milliseconds or microseconds um, for how long the user has to wait before they're kicked out. And so if you're trying to stop brute forcing on whatever you're writing the PAM module for, uh, then you would want to use PAM fail delay. Uh, 
Pam Unix actually sets the user authentication from Etsy password to Etsy shadow. And so if for some reason uh, your configuration is going to be, um, your Pam configuration for your program needs to auth off that directly, uh, you can use the Pam Unix. Uh, Pam succeed if uh, allows you to set constraints on attributes like you would. Uh, and it basically just checks the user who's trying to, um, can you, if, if so sorry about the projector. Um, the projector's broken, which is why we don't have the screen rolled down. The Pam, so uh, Pam succeed if uh, takes in a bunch of attributes of your user and then checks them based against configuration you provide and then will kick you through or, or not. And lastly, um, Pam PW quality. Um, a similar one is Pam cracklib. If you used Ubuntu 14, cracklib is standard there. Um, it sets constraints on passwords. And so if you want passwords to have a specific complexity, like a certain number of special characters, a certain number of uppercase characters uh, for your local users, um, Pam PW quality is what you would use in your password config. In the what's the so dot so extension for? Um, it's a so name. Uh, you don't actually when you compile things like Pam fail delay and Pam Unix, uh, you're not actually making an executable file. It's just a library that gets loaded. Uh, and so the dot so st st extension is for loadable li libraries. So. The thing that's actually neat about Pam, like a lot of this configuration doesn't really seem useful because it's like the system configures it for you and you don't really care. Um, but it can be really neat when you're trying to be malicious or checking for people being malicious. And so when you're given a user that has root access to the system, which means that they can change the uh, Pam config, uh, you can add a handful of things that's fairly neat. Um, you can add a malicious mo module that logs users' passwords. So the PAM libraries do have auth prior authentication tokens available to them. So it would not be hard for me as a developer to write a PAM module that takes that and either writes it to a file or sends it somewhere remotely. Um, fairly neat use case. Uh, and I don't know how many of y'all have checked your PAM config recently, um, but I haven't. So the odds of catching that are probably fairly low. Uh, similarly, uh, you can add a malicious module that sets a password backdoor. And so as we talked about the sufficient directive prior, um, as long as that module were to pass, you would be authenticated. And so you could take any program on the system you want that backs into PAM, put a malicious PAM module into it with sufficient, uh, and set your password for the entire pro program. Uh, fairly neat. Uh, and lastly, fairly easy to DOS people with PAM. Um, if you've ever played with PAM, odds are you've locked yourself out of the system for some reason or another. Um, and so uh, that's generally going to be user error instead of malicious, uh, but it is possible. And as an example of what a malicious PAM backdoor would look like, uh, it's PAM BD. Uh, it's a project on GitHub. Really, really neat. And so they, there's a handful of functions that PAM modules have to, uh, uh, have to implement. Um, but that aside, uh, this is how it works. And so you go through, and it checks the user password against a string set my password. And if it matches your password, regardless of the user, it kicks you through successfully. And so I could drop this in someone's SSH configuration for PAM. And if they have PAM enabled in SSH, I have a backdoor password to any user that can authenticate with SSH. Uh, super, super neat. And on to authorization, uh, which Andrew will cover with sudo. So um, if you use a Linux system, you've most probably used sudo at some point and basically most people just use sudo to get to the root user or to uh, get to using a uh, uh, here I'll go to the next slide um, basically you're going to be using sudo if you need to get security privileges uh, which is typically root but if you you don't know the sudo can actually do a lot more than that um, there are a lot of different commands that you can do in sudo uh, and you can actually use it as a logging system to check and see if someone's added a user or someone has done a sudo command. Uh, if, you give your if you give access to your box to someone that has sudo privileges and you trust them but you still want to see what they were doing on the box, you can use sudo replay, which is another great functionality. Um, so uh, you can configure your sudoers in Etsy sudoers and basically what that does is it just lets you uh, determine who has access to sudo and who has access to what kind of sudo command. So um, 
A lot of you might have used, I don't know, I used for when I first started using Linux, I used sudo su, didn't know really what it did. I just thought it, it let me get into the root directory. Um, basically what I did, or what it does is it switches you to a super user. Sudo su is just switching you to whatever user you instantiate. So if you type in sudo su uh, and an, a username, it'll change it to uh, the, the username that you type in. Another one is a sudo tac i, which switches you to the user root environment. So instead of you dropping you in a sudo shell in whatever uh, environment you're in or whatever directory you're in, it basically just switches you to a uh, shell that, that's independent of the one you were in previously. The sudo uh, tac s changes you to a sudo shell in your current directory, which basically uh, allows you to, uh, you know, use sudo without in the current directory that you're in if you need to do something temporarily. Um, and then sudo tac i tac u allows you to check the capabilities of that you have as a user and what you can do. Uh, it's really useful if you're on a box that you got user on and you need to see what kind of capabilities you can do for sudo. Um, so another, another useful tool of sudo, as I said, is sudo replay. Basically what sudo replay does is it allows you to check what someone's done in the sudo, uh, in sudo. And to enable it, you just have to um, type in uh, viz sudo, which types in vi, and edit your sudo config to, and type in these at the bottom. Uh, I believe that there are, they are commented already by default, and you just can uncomment them. But if you don't want to find them, you can just type these at the bottom. Basically, what it's doing is it's setting the default log output it's setting where it will output to and what it'll be checking for. Um, and then you can use sudo replay tac l to list your sudo commands. Uh, uh, and the tac l can be of a user or of a certain file that you want to output. Uh, you can also, there, you can do more with this. You can also replay it in r real time, which means that instead of it running based off of what you, uh, just listing all the commands it did, you can see how long they took and uh, what the time intervals were in between. And you can speed this up, too. Um, so Nick will be doing uh, get UID. Um, and so uh, with uh, set uid and set gid binaries, uh, you uh, have uh, the ability to take the permissions of the executable that you're using. Um, if you've ever been playing around with Chamad and you see the mysterious first octet, um, it's like if you ever want to change permissions, you set like 0755 or 0644, but you always set 0 because you don't want to mess with that first octet. Um, set uid and set gid are going to be part of that. So set uid um, sets the process owner to the owner of that file. And similarly, set gid sets the process group to the group of that file. And generally, when you're dealing with this, it's because you want to take um, a executable and allow that to run as root, regardless of the user running it. Uh, very popular to be seen in sudo. And so this can be useful to enumerate, particularly if you're on a box that has custom developed software. And so if you're looking for it, uh, the find utility is fairly great uh, if you've never used find. And so you just type in a path and then list the permissions, uh, 4,000 for set uid binaries and 2,000 for set gid binaries. Uh, and this is like, it sounds trivial and like it's not going to be useful, but your system now is only as secure as your root set uid and set gid binaries, which is a really, really big deal. Um, if you've ever heard of GNU Screen, uh, an alternative to Tmux, uh, Terminal Multiplexer, uh, that was originally installed as of summer 2016, I think it was summer 2016, uh, as a set a binary root. And so an exploit via screen allowed any local user to become root and completely attack, the, like own the system, just because screen was set uid. Uh, fairly big deal. And similarly, uh, if you've ever played some war games where you SSH into a system, uh, generally you're going to see set you with binaries here. Uh, if you're traversing through the levels as different users, uh, they allow you to grant user access in a manner that allows you to exploit users. Uh, fairly neat. <laughs> 
so as an example, if we hit, um, we, we scripted all of our stuff because that way we don't have to type it wrong. Um, and so if we go look at set UID, maybe, yeah. Um, so the find script is just the previous script that you saw on the PowerPoint, but it'll give you an idea of what kind of binaries can be running as set UID. And most of these uh, you probably haven't seen, um, but things like su or sudo are definitely going to be set UID uh, because they're giving you root access. Uh, and then like passwd, uh, you have to be root to change the uh, passwords and uh, users, and so that's going to be available there as well. Uh, oh, it also should be mentioned. Screen is no longer set UID. Uh, it is now installed um, as set GID UTIMP, uh, which is not a security problem. Um, but if you're ever working on an old system that hasn't been updated, it's worth checking screen. Uh, because if screen is installed set UID, odds are you can exploit it. And that module is publicly available on ExploitDB. And so it's trivial to run. It's a shell script and really, really easy to get root with. So now we move into something that's significantly more granular, uh, which is the Linux capability system. Uh, and that was added in kernel 2.2. So it was actually a fairly old feature, although not a lot of people um, have really discussed it, um, at least with my experience. And it switches the traditional pr privilege model of like a root user and a non-root user, or a, pseudo a super user and a non-super user, into more granular capabilities. Uh, and this follows into the line of the idea of least privileges. And so you're allowed to assign binaries uh, only the things they need to continue executing, um, which is a fa fairly neat idea. Uh, question, explain set UID and set GID again. All right. And so we set UID allows you to, uh, I'll, I'll show you all the files. That'll make a lot more sense. So I found all the set UID binaries here, as you can see. So if I check the permissions of these files, uh, sudo for, ex for instance, uh, you can see that it's readable by no one and writable by no one, um, but it is owned by root, uh, and the group is root, and it has an S here in the execute slot. Uh, that means it's been set UID. If you check, depending upon how your color scheme is, a lot of time these binaries show up red, which is fairly handy to identify them quickly. Um, but whenever you run a process uh, or run a binary, uh, it takes the user of the person, it takes the user permissions of whoever's running it. And so here, the username is CSG. And so if I were to run it, um, it, I would become, it would be running under the privileges of CSG. Uh, in the case of sudo, uh, because it's set UID, uh, it takes the privileges of the user root, which means that assuming sudo is written correctly, I can't do anything. But if I found an exploit in sudo, I can immediately become root because the process is root, regardless of who runs it. And so this makes permissions significantly more difficult because if you don't realize your, one of your employees wrote a set you would binary that's root and it's terrible and like you can break it really easily. Um, everyone can get root on your system fairly trivially, trivially um, if they can break the binary. So why might someone mistakenly make set UID binary? Because it sounds like a terrible idea. Um, so let's say for some reason I wanted to write a wrapper that as root could set user, like I could modify privileges in, a, in the password file so I could change users there. Uh, so I, I write this really neat script that allows you to do that. And so it edits the passwd file. I can add users at will. Really, really handy. Anyone can run it because it's set UID. Um, it gives me the flexibility of not caring about permissions. Um, it, the set UID binary can literally do anything at once. And that means me as the developer doesn't have to care. Um, until I write it poorly, and then you break it very easily, and that is that. Um, it's similar. If you don't know about capabilities, there's a lot of things that you can't do if you're not root. Um, writing raw packets to a socket, you cannot do, which you may need to do. And so you, instead of setting the capability to do that like you should, you set you would because you don't know what capabilities are, and um, then it's very easy to break. And back to capabilities. Uh, and capabilities. Similarly to set you binaries only affect the executable. Uh, and so they affect the running process after the executable. Um, these are not user level capabilities. But so looking at capabilities actively in use, uh, ping is probably the one that was most apparent to me and maybe most apparent to y'all. Um, if you've ever touched an older system or a system that doesn't have capabilities, you actually have to be root to ping. 
And so you try to ping it, we'll say your permission is denied, uh, and you have to pseudo ping something, which growing up post-1999 on computers, that seemed kind of dumb to me uh, until the, the capability system makes a lot of sense. Um, because if you want to access to a raw socket and write raw packets to the socket, uh, you need to be root. And that's, of course, why ping has that capability. And so this is uh, useful ways to manage capabilities. A uh, handful of binaries available to you as a user or an administrator to uh, interact with these. Git cap will list all of the capabilities available to you. Uh, set cap will set the capabilities. Uh, and then cap sh will list the capabilities available to the current process. So if for some reason, uh, you have a shell that you're trying to exploit because you're legally exploiting the system. Cap sh may be a handy way to enumerate what you can do. Because just because you're not root does not mean you can't do all the things root can do if you have all the right capabilities. And I'll demo that really quickly so you all can get an idea. And so we have a very simple script. Um, it just runs git cap tack r. It operates recursively over a directory, making it really handy to list out uh, various capabilities. And you can see the only one here uh, is ping, which has the effective permission of catnet raw, uh, as well as catnet admin. Uh, and there's a lot of capabilities. I think there's 38 right now. And so it can be very difficult to uh, establish what is doing what. But that kind of stuff is easily Googleable and um, not really useful to know what all of them do immediately. Uh, there's some consequences of this, unfortunately. Um, it seems like a really great process to make all these rules granular and allow only certain things to do certain things. Um, but some people have claimed and demonstrated examples of how a large majority of the capabilities are more or less equivalent to root access. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, it's a post by one of the GR security guys. Uh, they are, their organization is in an interesting state right now. They used to develop a, a system similar to SE Linux or AppArmor. Um, they quit developing that two summers ago. Um, it's within the last couple of years. Um, but one of their developers posted this link. Uh, I would recommend reading through it if you're interested in capabilities. It describes things like how the ability to mount a file system is equivalent to root um, because you can continue to backdoor things. Um, super interesting read, but kind of more in depth on capabilities than we are looking to go. And on to file access control lists uh, with Andrew again. So. File access control list uh, seems kind of redundant if you use Jamaud uh, because it's basically you think it does the same thing. And it, it does do the same thing at the end of the day. Uh, you, you get to um, change what, what user has what access to what directory and what they can do in that directory. But you can set a, a bit more specific uh, permissions with this, with set uh, flack, if you want to say that, uh, with set user uh, file access control. Um, so it, it just allows you to set a group and set a user and set what permissions they have for each file and each folder. And you can even change what file and folder uh, that user has access to on, like on the fly. You can set this with rules for people who even create uh, users. So if you create a user and they created a part of a certain group, you can set that user to be a part of a certain group without having to uh, chmod the, the folder or the file for them to access. So um, a couple of the commands are uh, get uh, flacl, F -A -C -L, um, and this basically just, you can do this on a directory and it'll show you the permissions. So if I go over to uh, this and I go uh, to, and I just created a, a script for the set, but if I do get uh, F -C -L, uh and then I do uh, the directory test, it basically is going to show me that the file is the file or folder, which it's a folder in this case, is test, and it's owned by CSG and the group is CSG, and the user CSG can ha has write access to it. Uh, if I want to change that, I can simply use the set command, and the set command allows me to modify uh, the user's permissions over test. So basically, you're using the m uh, Tack to change the permissions of the user uh, CSG to have write, read, or read, write, and execute permissions. Uh, so if we just run um, this, then and we do another on another get on test, we can see that now we have uh, 
now this user CSG has a write, write, read, and execute permissions compared to when it only had uh, write permissions. So um, this, this is really helpful if you're doing something like running an SFTP server where multiple people are getting on and putting files. Instead of having to go in for every user and set them to be able to go into certain files or uh, setting a group and everyone going a part of that group, you have more control over what user does what. Uh, whenever I ran an SFTP server, I, I used file access control so that whenever a user logged in at, or created an account, they, they would have a certain default path that they could go to and log in as. Um, so Nick will be doing auditing. that uh, file access control overrides Unix, if, if that's your question. It, it sets the Unix base. It's just, I guess, an interface, really. Um, so you can, if you're, you can, if you're a user and you don't want to run sudo uh, and you want to set permissions on, on your file for another user to access, that's what you would use file access controllers for, really. It's, so you don't have to sudo to be, to be able to change it. So it overrides. It overrides. <coughs> okay. But does it continue to display the old Unix permissions if you look with the LS text file? It shouldn't, but we can check. Uh, I think it does. It does? Yeah. Oh, fine. Uh -huh. So if we take his script and switch it to remove, um, actually, we have other users we can add. Um, so if we look, um, we have the permissions on that a group can read. And so if we chmod 0700 on test, uh, you can see we now removed at the Unix level the permissions. And take that and make that group, uh, specifically group CSG test. And so because it was the same group, it has changed. Um, I'm not sure on other groups. So if we look on other groups, let's say the cockpit WS group. Or the Android group. Um, Android group will work. Uh, and that also changed it. Um, and so get fackle test, right? Fackle. And so as you can see, um, I guess at the group level, it, it must be as permissive as an underlying level, um, is what I would assume. Um, yeah. is, that, is that what you've experienced? That's what I've experienced when I used the SFTP, uh, for whenever I did it with SFTP. That's, that's good. Okay. Yeah, I checked. And on to auditing. So if you've never um, dealt with a system that has had any sort of curious behavior or incident, um, auditing is a large part of remediating that problem. Um, it's very difficult to figure out what someone has done um, if you're not actively logging it. So that's the purpose of auditing. So AuditD does this um, for Linux, and it provides more information um, should an incident occur. So you have a lot of logging either with journal D or syslog or rsyslog, any of your logging mechanisms, but these are not necessarily directly designed for auditing. Um, so audit D is. And it's really designed to allow administrators to quickly show what activity has been happening. So for me as an administrator, if I would like to audit syscalls or audit file system accesses, um, based off the rules I have set, um, I can quickly do that. Unfortunately, Audit D is rule based, and so your auditing is only going to be as good as the rules that you have set. And so uh, you may be at a disadvantage if your rule list is very complicated or, or hard. Um, but it's a very, very powerful framework, only being able to really check system calls and file system access, but it allows you to do a decent variety of things. Uh, and so it allows you to check any sort of file access, so read, write, or execute. It allows you to check system calls. 
So it actually plugs into the kernel and audits every system call and what user and process is executing them. Uh, you can check commands run by checking the execute status of a pro program. You can check failed logins with PAM, and you can check firewall changes through syscalls. A fairly neat system um, if you're looking to better protect it against malicious users. So Red Hat provides examples in their documentation uh, that I think are fairly useful. Uh, and so you can change here. Uh, you can check files, um, as you can see here, uh, what permissions are being used on them, so writer access. Uh, and then dash k is going to be the rule name that you're setting. And so in this case, anyone who writes to Etsy password, which is the database for all users, um, it, will be no, it will be audited, and you can then go check it. Uh, similarly for insmod, uh, and so if you've never played with kernel modules, uh, they are um, it, it, external code that you can compile and run in the kernel. Um, generally useful for device drivers, um, but there's other ways to use kernels, uh, kernel modules. And so here you can check uh, anytime someone executes insmod, uh, you take that and audit it as a module insertion. Uh, also really useful because modules can be particularly useful for backdoors. Uh, because if I can insert a malicious kernel module, um, I'm basically running at a level below root. Uh, and that's quite a bit of fun if you're trying to be malicious. And then as an example of system calls, uh, if someone's trying to adjust the time of day, uh, this is there's a bunch of interesting cases. Uh, if you're trying to DOS someone and allow them and break a lot of their crypto, um, you can set their time way back uh, because a lot of things will fail. Um, but an example of if you're trying to audit syscalls because you know certain ones shouldn't be called, um, it's available there. And now, like setting rules is useful, um, but most of us don't really care at that level of granularity. Uh, so the actual useful things for us are AU search which allows you to query audit logs for events. So if, you're, if I'm confident that Andrew has been on my box and modifying things, I can just check all of the event, audit events for his user, uh, which can be fairly useful. And then lastly, probably the most useful as a user is AU report. It'll take the default audit, the default audit rules that are running and show you a, an example or a list of those events. So if we go into audit script, it's actually really easy. It's a single command. But we run AU report. And we have to be root. And type in our password. Uh, you can see we actually have quite a few events, uh, even though we just set this up recently. Uh, you can see the time range is since I provisioned the box today until now. Um, and as an aside, uh, if you're using any rail-based system, Fedora, Red Hat, CentOS, um, audit, is, audit D is going to be running by default. Um, I can't say the same for Ubuntu. I don't actually know. And unlikely on Arch or Void Linux or anything else um, that is not running um, built with Audit D enabled. Also should be mentioned, the audit subsystem of the kernel has to be compiled in, and so you're up, you're up to the, you're beholden to your maintainer of your distro. So Void Linux, for example, cannot use the audit subsystem uh, because it's not compiled in, unfortunately. Um, I'm not sure why this is. It could be a system Dism. Um, it may not be, um, but if you're using Fedora, it's readily available to you. So you can see here. Uh, we've had 208 changes in configurations. We've added or modified accounts, groups, and roles 14 times. Uh, probably the most useful thing as an end user is you can see that we've had one failed login. So someone attempted to log in, in this case, over SSH and failed. Uh, well, we've only had seven logins. And then it just continues to go on. So we have the number of authentications. So if I'm using sudo, that's an authentication. Uh, number of times we failed that, which is uh, kind of high, which is kind of sad because we can't type. Uh, and so we just it just runs down. This can be really useful if someone is on your box actively doing things and you can keep track of who's doing what. If I have a rogue process that's just trying to log in over and over again or failing at authenticating, um, it's a pretty good, easy, pretty easy way to identify that is through the audit system. Ah, and not mentioned here, but interested, interesting if you like um, the Elastic Stack. Uh, so we've mentioned it previously. It's a Da Kibana is a dashboard for analyzing logs, um, and you can feed them in from a bunch of different what they call beats. Uh, they provide audit beat, which directly taps into the audit subsystem and streams all this data out to Kibana for you. And so if you're looking to get a visualization of your audits and not having to um, actually use AU report because it doesn't, um, it's not the prettiest interface, uh, you can very quickly build dashboards with Kibana and audit beat. Um, fairly neat system. Yeah?
Um, so it doesn't put it in syslog, but it does put it in a log file. Um, it's you may be able to configure it to feed it into syslog, um, but if you don't want to use something like audit beat, you can also just tail the log files that audit provides itself. <coughs> does Red Hot slash Fedora come with a default rule set for audit D? Yes, that is what we're running right here. Um, it does some very basic things like logins, authentications, some system calls. Um, the most of what an end user or an administrator would be configuring is things like actually watching Etsy PassWD or actually watching a specific file you don't want people to execute. Or I guess I misspoke on that. Um, auditing is really not for catching people doing something you don't want them to do, but rather catching things that may, you may not want them to do. Um, adding a user is not inherently malicious. But if I audit that and I see that someone added five users and I don't know any of them, um, it's very easy to see they are being malicious with that. And securing services uh, with Andrew. So for the first service, we're going to be talking about SSHD, which is basically just SSH Damien. Um, if you use, you can really, uh, it doesn't matter whether you call it SSH or SSHD. Um, when you do turn it on in the services, if you're using Ubuntu or uh, any Debian instance that has SSH installed, typically you can use SSH to start it up, but when you're using Fedora, you have to type in SSHD. Um, basically, what SSHD is, is it allows you to write a config file, uh, and it's the Debian for SSH. Um, SSH also has a config file, but SSHD is the Damien for it, so you can stop the service and restart it. Um, so the config file is located in Etsy SSH and SSHD underscore config. Uh, for the options, um, these are a couple of the options that I use in my personal box and uh, is relatively secure for just a default option. Um, permitting root login over SSH is not a good idea generally. You don't want be someone to be able to just log in as root if they brute force your password if they, or if they grab your key or if maybe there's an exploit or something like that. Um, public key authentication basically allows it so that if you, have, if you create an SSH key and you add it to the public key section which is, uh, can be located anywhere, um, then this makes it so that you can log in with that key. The uh, authorized keys file is the file that you put your public key in so that you can be authorized to use. Um, you can put this in anywhere, but typically people put it in .ssh. You do have to make sure the permissions are right, so you can chmod uh, 700 or 644 um, for inside the file. And then uh, password authentication. I don't use path password authentication for my boxes because I have the key. But if you want to use path password authentication because you think your password's strong enough, or you don't think too many people are going to be hitting your box or it's secure, uh, you can just you can turn this to yes. You can have public key authentication and password authentication enabled, so you can log in either or. Uh, but if you do disable both, you won't be able to log in with to your box. So keep that in mind. Um, empty or permit empty passwords just means that people can just hit enter constantly. Uh, to log into your box uh, if, they per if it's permitted. So you don't want people to ha be able to log into your box with an empty password uh, if you have an empty password by any means. Uh, maybe you install a service that's running that creates a user and that user has an empty password that you just don't set and uh, they log in with SSH. So it, you, two things can be learned from that is don't install services you don't know uh, that might create a user and also don't permit empty passwords. Uh, and then use PAM. Uh, earlier, Nick talked about the, the different PAM uh, rules, and basically this just enables them. You can disable them if you want. Um, it's up to you, really, if you have a PAM configuration or if you don't want to use PAM. Uh, so, um, if we, we can, I can quickly uh, show you. Can, do we have access to SSH config on this? Yeah. Okay. So, if I go to. Uh, uh, th this is the location of the SSH config. Um, SSHD config, so you can, so I can just, uh, let's do less. So basically, uh, the beginning is what we have here is if I scroll down to the stuff that I was talking about, uh, authentication, we have root permitted, um, don't have that, we just have that because, because this is not a, box that we're using actively. Um, then public key authentication, again, 
we have it as we don't if it's commented out that means that it's disabled so but typically you'd want to have it yes um, and then in the authorized key files a key file you can actually instantiate multiple places that you can have an authorized key so if you put dot ssh slash authorized keys and you want to have another uh, location for those keys you can just put a space and then the second location for pu public keys to be accessed if you want it to be in the directory of whatever user you just put a tilde before beforehand uh, and so if you if we scroll even more down we can see that uh, we start to see the password uh, authentication uh, and the permit empty password we have password authentication uh, so we can log into our box with our password and then empty password is no uh, it seems boring, but people typically forget to configure their SSHD config when they first get on a box. So it's one place that you might want to check whenever you're on a box. Um, so oh, yeah. OK, so for those of you who don't know what SSH is, it's this handy service that lets you go and have a shell in your box. Uh, whether your default shell is bash or sh or zish, like it, it, it doesn't matter what the default or Python 3 if you like that. Uh, if you use Emacs as your, your shell, um, one, th that's wonderful. But uh, basically, SSH just lets you have a connection to your box. And uh, these are the settings to make sure that they're secure. And not everyone can just have a shell or a Emacs shell on your box. Um, so, And for firewalls, so let's say you set up SSH. And you're, you're good to go in that department, and you have a key only login. Uh, now you need to secure your firewall or secure your box with, with a firewall. And by default, most, if not all, Linux boxes have IP tables. And IP tables is the underlining um, thing that most, it, most programs interface with whenever they are uh, setting rules for your IP tables. Now, IP table rules can be a little bit complicated or tricky to write if you've never written one before or if you've never seen one before. So there are a lot of things that you can do to interface with it. Um, IP tables in general, the, the rule is you can block ports, open ports. You can permit certain, you can put certain ports in groups, which ha means it has certain permissions. So let's say you want the entire IP range of a country to have access to only this port and another country to have an access to another port. Basically, that you can set that by setting different zones. And IP tables is really good to do that. You can also just flat out block IPs and block ports. And you can open ports and uh, deny ports. So one of the, uh, the two main, anyway, uh, interfaces that people use are Firewall D and UFW. If you're using a RHEL, Fedora, CentOS uh, box, you will most likely have Firewall D, or as some people know it as just Firewall CMD. Uh, and oh, if you're using a Ubuntu or a Debian box, or you installed UFW uh, because you like UFW, then <laughs> you will have UFW. The difference between these is Firewall D more acts like an API. It basically just gets information from IP tables and sends information to IP tables. You're not really, it, it's not interfacing anything other than just sending commands to IP tables in a really nice, pretty format. UFW ha it has a full like GUI if you install the GUI. Uh, if you just use the command line, it just uh, makes everything simpler as far as whether you're uh, using UFW or Firewall D. It just makes the output and input a lot prettier. Um, Another thing is I would recognize is that if you have firewall D, you have to reload every time you add a rule. Uh, or if you add three rules, you need to reload at the end of that. UFW typically reloads on its own. Also, um, you, can, you can set it to not reload on its own. I think by default, it does not load on, reload on its own, but you can. Yes, you have a comment? No, you have to do firewall D, tac tac reload. I don't. Uh, if you had a permanent rule, it, oh, if, always pull immediately. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I always just permanent and temporary. So. Which is not by default what people, so the general case is, is that you have to, re you should reload if you're per per setting a rule like that. OK, anyways, um, so 
if we go on to some commands, uh, to start up firewall D, uh, system CTLs enable firewall D if you're using system CTL. Uh, it, it, and then uh, to start the session, uh, system CTL start firewall. That's just basic uh, Linux starting commands. Um, but whenever you want, if you want to actually see if the, the, the firewall D is up, you can check the state of it. Uh, and then to the actual part where why you would use firewall D or firewall CMD is uh, adding a rule. So basically, firewall CMD uh, is just calling the command. Then you call the zone. So if you want this to be the public zone, which means it's outfacing, by default, the public zone is the outfacing uh, zone. So you, can, you, you add that to the zone. You add the service. So let's say you want HTTPS because you're running a web service. You would say HTTPS or the port uh, slash the protocol. So for example, I could put 22 slash TCP or 44, uh, 3, 444, 3, or 80, uh, and then you can do the protocol slash the protocol. Um, and then again, to reload the rules, it's firewall CMD, tac tac, reload. So if I quickly go to uh, this box and I quit out of this uh, and I go back to our scripts that we have that likes to freeze, um, if I I can simply cat the firewall D start script, which basically just enables and starts. Um, don't run sudo in your scripts. I just don't want to type it. <laughs> so if we type that, uh, then and we do uh, on this nothing, nothing at all. Um, so if I do status uh, firewall D. Uh, we can get that it's active and that it's running uh, the dynamic firewall, Damien. Uh, so if I want to check using the firewall command, I can simply do sudo firewall D, or if I believe I have a script for that. So uh, basically, it's going to be checking the um, state. So if I do, it's running. So it gives me a very condensed version of what the status was. Um, which is nice if you don't want to read all of that, if you don't have an error. Um, and then to add a rule, um, I have this script, which basically all it's doing is it's enabling SSH on the public port, and it's making it permanent. Um, it's already enabled because I'm SSH to do it right now. But if I run it, uh, then it's, it'll just tell me it's already enabled, so I'm doing nothing at this point. Uh, so if I want to reload really quickly, I type in firewall cmd tech tech reload, which I don't need to because it's already enabled. But that's how you add a port um, to fire to or add a port to firewall D, which interfaces with IP tables, which is your firewall on your box. So if I go back, I can start talking about UFW which is very simple and it is on Ubuntu if you install Ubuntu by default. Uh, if you, I can't test it because we have a Fedora box, so you're just going to have to trust me on these commands. Uh, but UFW status, it, it checks the status whether it's running. It'll have similar output to firewall CMD stat state. Um, then allow port, UFW allow 22. Yes, very simple. You can just allow what it, it's three words, very simple. Um, there is more complicated commands for UFW, but for the purposes of this tutorial or this like overview, um, this is a really basic way of allowing uh, ports and IPs. So you can do the same thing with an IP address, actually. So if you did UFW uh, allow IP and then the IP address, it'll allow that IP address. Or if you want to deny an IP address, you can deny an IP address. Or if you want to deny a range of IP addresses, you can do UFW excuse me, deny uh, from then the range of IP addresses that you want to deny. Uh, another, another useful tip for UFW is that uh, make sure the service is running, because it might not be. Um, <laughs> I've had that problem. <laughs> but And so if we continue, we will go into intrusion detection, which, which Nick will cover. Let me. Uh, yeah, let me scroll down and see 
Oh, that's the question? OK. So um, key-based login is basically where you have, uh, it's like a key to a door. Um, you have the, there's two parts of the key. There's the key and then there's the lock. Uh, in this case, the lock has to allow that key. So you gen when, you do an SS when you generate an SSH key, you're generating a lock and a key. And when you put the lock on the computer as the authorized key section, you can use your lock to unlock the door or unlock the, the port to get into the shell. That's a really, really basic way of expl explaining it. But I hope you understand. S sounds good? OK, now let me. Sorry, headphone users. And on to intrusion detection. Uh, a section surprisingly covered in the Red Hat security manual. Um, at least I was surprised. Uh, generally not something that you're going to be seeing in a standard deployment simply because of the perceived complexity that goes along with it. Uh, but in this case, it's actually very simple. Uh, and so, uh, so some background knowledge that's useful to know uh, to understand how the aid utility works. Um, Linux is going to be primarily configured through flat text files. Almost everything on your system can be configured with a text file, which is um, opinions aside, uh, if you're a Linux fanboy, you probably like it, uh, and it's really handy. And so, for example, users, uh, every user on your system is an Etsy passwd. Um, every password on your system is, should be an Etsy shadow. It may be an Etsy passwd, and if it is, Google how to fix that real quick because it's not good. Um, but uh, passwords should be an Etsy shadow. Uh, and then, like previously discussed, all of your authentication configuration uh, will likely be an Etsy pam.d. So like, why is this useful? Uh, so aid, the advanced intrusion detection environment, uh, kind of snapshots the file system state based off what you uh, describe it to take a snapshot of, and then compares it on subsequent runs. And this doesn't sound very useful. Um, it sounds kind of trivial, actually. But it lets you do some very, very powerful things. And so if we look at my box where I have aid set up, um, we can take. Oh, I didn't write the aid scripts. That's OK. So the aid utility is fairly simple. Um, you can start it with aid tac i, uh, and you initialize the database. Um, we can take a look at the aid config file. Conf. Uh, and they have a bunch of uh, basic config at the top. Um, should be mentioned, these are not the default rules shipped with Fedora. Um, they are actually a lot more complex. Um, I, simpled them, I made them all simpler, so it would run a lot more quickly. Um, but it, it's very, very basic. Um, all we do is check the, the integrity of Etsy passwd. And, and so in this case, we uh, are going to check, check the last access time, uh, the last change time, uh, user permissions, as well as the contents of the file. So if we run aid in check mode, taxi, uh, you can see that there are no differences between the database and the file system. Uh, good for us. That means no one has modified that file uh, in any form or fashion. But as an administrator, I'm allowed to add users. So if I add a user named Alan, uh, we can now check again. And you can see that we have a much longer output saying that we have two entries changed. Um, and that's the Etsy passwd and the SC passwd dash file. And so as a user, you can very quickly check and see that configuration has been modified on your system, uh, and very cheaply in this case. Uh, that ran in a matter of uh, less than a second. And so you can run this on a cron job, uh, so run it every hour, and then check very quickly to see if your database has been modified. Uh, that's, it sounds like, that's, like that doesn't sound like a super big deal, but if anyone gets on your box and adds a user for any sort of persistence, like you can trivially check that. Like that's just a cron job you run every hour and send an email on a failure. And you have host intrusion detection system like trivially, super, super handy. Um, and just for sake of like completeness, uh, you can update the database with aid tag u um, if you're root. Uh, and it runs again. It dumps the file into a new database. You copy the database over to the expected location, uh, and you're good to go. You can even, like, if you're feeling really paranoid, you can take these uh, outputs of the hashes of the database, and then you can store those elsewhere. And so if you're on a system and you think it's been attacked, uh, you can check and make sure the hash matches. 
uh, super useful for you as an end user, because assuming someone is attacking your box and they know you have aid deployed, um, it would not be hard for them to change the database and you would never know about it. But as long as you can check the hashes, um, they really cannot change it. Like cryptographically, they can't change the database and you not know about it uh, unless they find a hash collision, which, or it, it'd probably actually be a pre-image attack. Um, very difficult hash attack that you would have to be able to do to attack your box. Um, not likely going to happen. Yes, just don't pick MD5. Um, as an aside, uh, MD5 is super vulnerable. SHA-1 is vulnerable to a collision attack. Um, MD160, no idea. Um, SHA-256 and SHA-512, generally considered secure today. Um, I would recommend taking those if you're looking. Does AID provide any real-time monitoring? And how do these checks differ from audit dechecking? So AID is designed to uh, provide non-granular alerts on large changes. Um, it didn't tell you what entry changed in the database. Um, it just told you that the file changed. So you as a user are using this for alerting, not auditing. Very similar but different concepts. Uh, auditing is going to be used. You know that you've been attacked and you want to find out what they did. Alerting is I'm being actively attacked recently and I want to stop it now. Uh, and so. It doesn't provide real-time monitoring, but it's designed in a way that you run it on a cron job, uh, which means you run it every periodic time period. Uh, this could be every five minutes. This could be every hour. This could be every day uh, based on your needs. Uh, and then you can even have your cron tab uh, set up to send you an email if any of the cron jobs fail. Uh, and so you could fairly trivially set up aid in check mode. Uh, it runs the check every night. And you can see within the day if someone's added a user. Um, depending upon the number of files you're checking, uh, if you're doing only very small number of files, like the past ABD file, uh, you could run that every five minutes. And like you don't care because it's so cheap. And you can tell within five minutes someone's added a user on your box, which could be you, but it may not be. What does a database contain? Um, depends upon how you configure it. You can have it be very granular. You can have it be very verbose. Um, and by default, it's going to check profile permissions, I think owner and group, and the content as well. Um, it's largely information that's found in the inode. Um, it's mapping that to the database. But that's all fairly configurable. If you don't want all that data, you may not. Um, and so you just may not care. And if you're, if you're like looking for more, aid is super well documented online. Um, it's fairly verbose in features. And so if you're really looking to configure this on your system, I'd highly recommend reading the documentation yourself, uh, not just deploying the basic config I just showed. Oh, Ruff, we were doing so good without crashing the questions. Oh. And that's that. So new questions once again. Oh, continue recent. Oh, can we continue? Let's go. We can continue. Awesome. Uh, and so now on to compliance. If you're dealing with um, any sort of system at any sort of business that has to touch any sort of private customer data or payment card information, uh, any sort of medical information,